So good uh, evening, everyone. Good morning and good night to everyone that, that is here connected with us today. Today, we're here to talk about a two-year summary of IFMBE's Clinical Engineering Division. And let me just uh, have a moment to express um, how happy I, I am to, to introduce you to CED's chairman today, Tom Jodd. And for that, we are going to address a series of milestones uh, and also key activities that CED has done for the past two years um, in how we support clinical engineers and healthcare professionals throughout the world through what IFMB's Clinical Engineering Division has done over the past two years. It is my honor to introduce to you CED's board chairman, Tom Judd, who will be summarizing the two-year work that IFMB's Clinical Engineering has done to benefit clinical engineers and also other uh, healthcare professionals around the world. Tom, the floor is, the floor is yours. You are muted, Tom. You might want to. How about now? How's my voice now? Is that, is that good volume? Yeah, we hear you just fine. Great. Uh, thanks so much for this opportunity. And uh, first of all, I just want to acknowledge that our community, as well as the rest of the world, is going through a very difficult time. I mean, we think of our friends, our brothers and sisters in uh, Beirut. We think of how COVID is just unleashing against many countries and, you know, in Africa and elsewhere around the world, in India, uh, in the Western Pacific. So as we start and reflect on what CED's done, and there's a lot of joy in this story that we're gonna share today, and these activities we're gonna share together today in this hour, uh, we gotta reflect on the suffering that many are going through. So I. We, we, don't, we don't need to be reminded to be sober about this, but it, you know, many people are suffering and uh, you know, it's our job as clinical engineers to be empathetic and understanding of that difficult circumstances. Still gonna talk and I'm gonna talk briefly and hopefully uh, consistently about the great story of CED and where we are and where we're going. Um, wanna talk, touch on briefly my personal journey, but you know, define, you know, our profession with WHO our terminology and some of the uh, unique com competencies that we have, as well as our emergence during the COVID time. Uh, talk a little bit about our specific COVID response, and, but then, you know, into the wider work as we come alongside ministries of health uh, with our, our national health priorities, how can we make a difference? And we do that through the context of our societies often. We can do it individually, but we can do it through our societies. And, you know, CED is strongly trying to help you grow your, create if necessary, but grow your national societies and your local voice. You know, my background, a lot of pictures here, but, uh, you know, I had 15 years, or, by the way, this presentation is gonna be available early on. We, we welcome your questions through chat and the Q&A function. And we'll try to address them through the hour. Um, you know, I had a CEHTM my first 15 years in a teaching hospital and then a community hospital. And during that first 15 years of my career, um, you know, 45 years ago and forward, um, started to visit Latin America and then uh, China and some other places and former uh, Commonwealth of Independent States in those first few years. And so my international vision was shaped through those experiences. Um, so I started out with a traditional CEHTM. I did a 12 year, um, I guess, 45 degree turn into quality and safety in a large health system in the US. And uh, while I was in that 12 years, uh, I was still doing clinical engineering at night, you might say, uh, in, in every region of the world. Um, but then like many of you got, saw that digital health was coming, CEIT we used to call it, um, and was part of the leading uh, from, for clinical engineering and that large health system, bringing digital health into play um, and, and continue to have a, co a connection to Kaiser Permanente uh, as I'm on their doctor journal, even though I retired formally in 2016. You know, one drumbeat in the background for me in terms of national societies has been the American College of Clinical Engineering and, you know, with Dr. Yadin David, one of the faculty members here today, and I and many others uh, started these advanced clinical engineering workshops that you know, 25 years later, by 2015, they've been in 90 countries and over 50 of these uh, week-long programs. 
So finding out what's on your mind uh, around the world. And then um, my involvement with CED, CED has been around over 40 years, clinical engineering division, but uh, Dr. David sort of in the modern era got it recharged. I was elected board secretary in 2015 and chair in 2018 until next year. And happy to be a part of the Global CE Journal. So some of these pictures, first day CEW, and that's a young Adriana Velazquez and a younger Tom Judd, and then other many names around the way through that uh, 50th ACEW in 2015, and then of course CED in Rome, many of you there, I hope. And so what does CE and HT, CEHTM and digital health look like? It's been about people, it's been about workshops, uh, seminars that got us into ministries of health, it's been about credentialing issues, creating global tools, uh, key publications, and then our work today. What are the quick definitions? Of course, these are WHO definitions. They're on our websites for health technology and clinical engineering. And of course, that uh, all important resolution at the World Health Assembly in 2007 about um, ministries of health around the uh, world uh, better managing health technologies to make a difference in healthcare for our families. One of the things we did at Rome and since then, um, we define uh, unique clinical engineering and HTM competencies that we use in our health systems. And you all know that we've had uh, monthly webinars around these topics uh, this year. And we've added some other uh, cool things to that, uh, like how to write research papers around telehealth and uh, working with stakeholders and lots of other key issues. But we've worked on these 10, and many of you know about that. In fact, one of them tomorrow, the sixth in the series, is the use of digital medicine to improve patient care. So please register for that. We'll, we'll put the link in the chat. But on to a CED and growth. Um, so CED since 2015 has grown to a 200 person board and collaborator team from 80 countries. So excited about some, that many of you are a part of that. Um, a lot of sort of our recent growth got kicked off in March when Adriana Velazquez called uh, Dr. David and I and said, help. And we've, uh, CED has responded in a major way. We're so excited about that. Um, and so, yeah, those town halls that we did, uh, beginning with a global COVID day in April and then six town halls in May and another one in July, we had access to 101 countries. So that led to this story here that we'll tell you graphically is that around after Rome, we were connected to 80 or so countries. Well, um, after that, uh, here we go, this is gonna change. After that last uh, round, uh, including July, we were connected not to 139, the circle number, but by August now, connected to 170 countries um, where we have close clinical engineering or, and or health technology leader contacts. And so we're in a regular discussion with these folks week, week in, week out. But Okay, numbers are nice, Tom, but what did you actually do for the world? What did CED do for the world? Because we, we did it together. And we did, um, I would say, five major things. We created a knowledge network on critical topics in the midst of COVID. And you know about that through our town halls and our other competency webinars. We did that through listening hard to Adriana. Uh, she's got our monthly newsletters. We put that on our blogs, on our website. We've had weekly meetings with her and uh, working with her funding partners, you know, including Gates and uh, World Bank and uh, Clinton and others around the world and are, are part of their discussions trying to make a difference. So besides um, the, those first two items, trying to get to the next page, come on. Uh, we've had, we've got nearly 90 weekday uh, CED hacking e-newsletters, uh, and we've uh, put all that information on our COVID-19 resource page on the website. You know, uh, Elliot Sloan came to us and said, we've got it, we've got to put out vetted and validated information. There's just a flood of information coming. So uh, Dr. David and I and Stefano and Lee Ben and uh, Rosanna and Calroy and I have looked at these daily during the week, and we've got, a, I think we're actually by now have published about our 90th uh, a daily overview, and we wish you'd be a part of that. Certainly many of you have been a part of the uh, What's Up Q&A. Uh, now 130 subscribers from about 50 countries, but these folks pass it on to their networks 
in their countries and their regions, problem solving about COVID and other issues. And then, you know, when Adriana called Dr. David and I in mid, in late, uh, mid to late March, we said, hey, this is Friday, next Wednesday, you can come to our uh, board and collaborator meeting and 55 of you showed up. Um, and we listened hard and we volunteered and we came alongside her. And I'm very proud of what you've done. So how did that work in terms, in terms of a COVID response? Well, here on the left are the six topics that we uh, reviewed together, um, oxygen delivery, uh, personal protective equipment, CPAP, BiPAP, pulse ox, ventilators, decontamination. And then we looked at them from a holistic systems point of view, which is what we clinical engineers are great at, honestly. And we wrote white papers about the first of these, still working on the one on decontamination. What a big topic. Um, so we've been responding. So some conclusions is that we've grown a lot. We've got a reliable network. We've uh, built on things since those uh, workshops and those town halls with, with WHO. We, we had a couple interns, master's level folks, working on training scripts, which is what uh, WHO has been doing since June and about to uh, unveil a bunch of their training scripts around critical de devices. We've been working with global coalitions, particularly in LMIC countries. And, you know, th those of you listening have been a part of your country's COVID-19 programs. And I, I hope we've encouraged some of those, but I know you, you didn't need us. You just went out and did it because you're good. But uh, we, we had one a couple weeks ago for the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, Middle East, North Africa region that was outstanding that CED did help with. So yeah, there's rapid change going on in our field and we need to network more than ever before. And even though challenges like language, so excited about so many people coming together. Um, one of our partners, Yuma Tim, um, out of France is uh, having the first French language town hall this Friday, August 14th. Please register for that if you choose. But those town halls, another five town halls in French. Uh, so thankful for that effort by uh, Humatim and uh, AFIB, the National uh, Society in France. So in the midst of this, we're, we're looking for the best practice, the guidelines for management of health technologies with appropriate review by all you experts that we can uniformly adopt. We've been working hard on that. And it's a great time to promote the profession and, and our contributions to the ministries of health. Adriana told us in May in the middle of those uh, town halls that at the World Health Assembly this year, you know, many countries, prime ministers or presidents and many countries, uh, ministers of health started talking about medical equipment in a very valued way in the midst of COVID. And we need to build on that. So. And we're not done yet, and we need to hear your input on that. But let me move on to some other things. So how can we help? Let me, and let me do a time check here. Um, OK. Yeah. Well, when, we, when Dr. David and others have issued the call for clinical engineers to come together, like we've done in Hanzhou, China in 2015, and in uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil in 2017, and in Rome, Italy in 2019, we had our summits of clinical engineers around the world. What did you say to us that you wanted CED to work on and to work with you to, to make better? And one was professional identification. I think we've been doing that. Professional engagement inside the profession and outside. You've been hearing that we've been doing that. Uh, these competency webinars this year that I spoke about earlier, and that there's one tomorrow on digital health. You can ask uh, Elliot Sloan about that today, who's on the line with us. Um, those have always been cast where we tell best practice stories in the context of that young clinical engineer that's excited and wants to grow in their leadership skills. And so we always add that piece into those uh, webinars. You know, Dr. Jim Weir and uh, Lee Ben and Fabiola have led our work around credentialing and we're um, more to come on that. We've been coming alongside ministers of health more and more uh, around policy and legislation. And, you know, wow, telehealth, we'd already started working on that even before COVID hit, but then, it, you know, telehealth is changing the way of healthcare delivery around the world now. And we're planning a webinar on that um, a month from now. And of course, you know, out of those summits over the years, you know, the Global Clinical Engineering Journal was uh, born. And I, I'm gonna ask my friends to say more about that today during the, uh, this hour. So how are you 
and I'm talking about each of you individually, as well as the societies that you're a part of in your country, how are you gonna to respond to your national health priorities? That's a big ask on my part. And one answer is um, you better look at the clinical engineering success stories that we published a couple of years ago, 400 stories from 125 countries to get some ideas. You better know what the global health priorities are and what your national health priorities are. Um, you need to think about what hasn't been studied yet that you could study and what can you and your society do now. And Luis, help me out here. Tell me how, how many minutes I got left. 10 minutes, sir. Thank you. Cool. Um, and I give you an example today of how we're receiving these stories. Uh, our good friends from Mexico. Um, you see on the left, you know, in the success story document we published in 2018 in the Global Clinical Engineering Journal, there were six categories, innovation, access, management, was, that's HT management that we're all familiar with, and health systems. So what did somebody do at the local level in an HTM context? What did somebody do at the national level? Um, so management and health systems, three, four, five was quality and safety, and six was digital health. So we gathered stories, 400 stories, 125 countries from that you did. Um, so that's one place to look about how you're doing in your country with addressing national health priorities. But then in Rome, you know, you already heard me say, we had so many abstracts then, like 300 abstracts for Rome, where we had 1,000 people from 70 countries. Well, we're going to start talking today about Orlando, which is sep late September of 2021. We all believe that COVID will be under control and we'll be able to meet face-to-face -face here at Disneyland, Disney World in, in Orlando, Florida. But in Rome, uh, a year ago, we had a bunch of uh, submissions in those categories um, of innovation, access, management, quality, and digital health. And you can see these are several of the ones that came from Mexico. So we continue this success story thing and, and we continue to have a focus in certain areas, but where might our focus be as we move forward? Well, here's a quick slide uh, that Adriana has shown before of how does the world look at global health priorities? The sustainable development goals from WHO is a great lens to look through, but on the left, you really see kind of a summary of the kinds of issues people look at. Of course, every country, mine included, has a focus on maternal child and neonatal health. Of course we do. But then there's a focus on infectious disease, um, COVID being the huge uh, elephant in the room right now, non-communicable diseases, chronic disease. Uh, in Mexico, you know, it's diabetes they have a huge focus on. Health systems development, you know, many of you have old facilities and are trying to develop in the new, both on the private and public side. And, you know, how can we help? How can we as clinical engineers help? And then you know, the historical health systems funding, there's not enough money to get stuff done. So this is sort of a snapshot of the global view. What did it look like in Mexico? And I have had the privilege of speaking to the public side of Mexico a week ago. So let me show some of their data. But as you see, they're combating COVID, of course, chronic disease with a focus on diabetes, health systems funding, access, health system development, you know, bringing older hospitals up to speed and getting the right staff to do the right job there and then quality and safety. So, and this, this is a snapshot of their COVID situation a week ago. So, so on the left, you see more about what's going on with diabetes. They're focused on diabetes. This is from their Ministry of Health website and what they're doing about access. And on the right, you know, how they're bringing the right stakeholders together to make a difference. So my point is where does clinical engineers where do you in, in that country or in your own story, in your own country, fit into this formula? Um, slide's a little bit busy, but how do, this was a, I did a report card of how CEs have been addressing these priority health issues with the stories we've created so far and that we published a couple years ago. And the answer is, in some areas, great. Some other areas, not so great. Particularly infectious disease, we weren't great. Well, if we published our stories now about how we've addressed COVID, that would begin to change, of course. Uh, this slide I threw in there just to show at the primary level and the secondary level, the hospital level, um, 
how some of our devices and system and tests fit into the needs of your country. So you can read about this. All these slides will be available later. But I really wanted to get to this. So how will you respond, both individually, together with your colleagues? Perhaps you're going to need partnership with CED. And you know, we clinical engineers have this legacy of creativity and innovation. And you know, we need to figure out ways to work together now. You know, if that was the end of the story, that'd be great, but I gotta leave you with some principles that are important. You know, how do we do what we do every day and do it better? First of all, we have to build trust. And once you have that trust, how do you um, leverage the trust that you've built? And you already heard me say, we've gotten this unique time in history when we are demonstrating our value and we've gained this platform, this voice, we're using the leadership principles that we showed where you know, we do that through data and science, but with compassion where we have built our global community and helping one another. So how do we build on this trust that we've earned? And how can we grow trust? And, you know, part of, you know, we look internally as we do that. We looked externally as we align with these other NGOs and the World Bank and so forth. We do that through our support of WHO, you know. What they do is incredible and we, you know, we're here to help them as they work with their 194 countries. A second thing I would summarize and say is we do this through knowledge. I mean, duh, <laughs> but knowledge of what? Not only technology knowledge, but leadership and management knowledge. And you know, use that culture of innovation that we're so good at. And we do that in CEHTM, we do that in digital health, and we do it, um, you know, early in my career, I was a, clinical engineer at a community hospital, and I came up with a four-year plan, you know, to do more CEHTM across four critical areas of that hospital, and this was in the early 1980s, so digital health was way out on the horizon a bit. You know, the first year we did everything there was to do, I thought, around general biomedical equipment. The second year, imaging, which was a mouthful back in 1981, um, you know, CT scan and all the x-ray and ultrasound and stuff. The third year around clinical lab, once again, most of these people, you know, most of that work had always been done by the vendors. So, you know, I had to have the trust with administration to take things off contract like you guys do today. Uh, and the fourth year was computer stuff, the early days. Um, so if I would fast forward and say, what did, what did my head look like in 2015 when I was with uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Mario Castaneda, and we were in Xi'an, China, and the the guy with the pediatric practice that had been gone on 25 years, but he didn't have enough access. So we said, what is the combination of CE and HTM that we can do in Xi'an, China in 2015 to 2020 that would triple his access? And, you know, the answer is um, guidelines driven care, having all the resources lined up, social media before and after the visit, there were ways to triple his access. He had 150,000 people living within a half mile of his office. So he had a gazillion young families around to send kids to. So how do we take that knowledge and apply it in, you know, into the challenges that we see every day? And the last thing besides trust and knowledge, you know, we have a responsibility as a community. Um, you know, our role is to serve, um, you know, who are we serving, our family, our country? We're serving the vulnerable people that live around us. You know, that's a mouthful. And, you know, I, get, I could get emotional about that. But the point is, we're here to serve. And for each of you, you know what that looks like. You know, and we have a calling to this profession. It's more than just a job. What's your story? You know, I've heard so many stories from so many of you. And, I, you know, I love it. And not all the stories are good. There are hard things going on now. And we know that. But how are you going to tell your story and communicate and encourage and bless others with your work? So with that, uh, Mr. Luis, back to you.